of hip hop music. As the days going on and I realize this, I'm getting more angry. He's definitely implicated in taking two of the lives of, you know, of the greats of hip hop music. But when you think about the effect that he had, he almost single handedly ruined the art form of rap by what he was promoting because he was the spirit behind it and his misogyny and his violence was built right into it. At least in my life, there's very much discussion about how this black form of art was corrupted and purposefully so because it was so empowering in the beginning right? and it started a certain way but the violent aspects began to overtake it the sexuality the substance abuse became like main features of the art form and to this day like it's been ruined by it and that's him that's him and the white male executives just in the same way where you get like these like light-skinned female rappers who are supposed to be these like uh representations of black women they're always light-skinned usually over sexualized not particularly talented and you're just like there's no way like i see girls on this app that are better than that i don't think people realize how deep the the well runs on these people who are at like the upper echelons of the society how much work they have to do to keep this all under control and they leave nothing to chance I'm a very uh, humanitarian person, like embarrassingly so. But if I wanted to have control of that and keep all of the people that I love safe or even just all of you watching this, the things I would have to do to maintain that and control that as a good person would be wild. So I don't understand why people don't notice that like very bad people are running the world. And these are the things that they do on purpose. Oh, an empowering black art form. Let's uh, take it down from within. Let's install a creepy abuser who's willing to do anything. Take out his own, take out his friends, family maybe. Install him to do all of our dirty work. He'll be the gatekeeper. He'll decide who'll be famous and who won't be. He'll decide who's blackballed. And if he can't abuse these people, he'll get rid of them. And even if they aren't able to be abused, we have some kind of compromising video. We'll have something. But don't worry, at the last moment, we'll have all the executives to just block. I already talked about this in another video, but I felt like I'm getting angrier and I'm realizing this. I'm realizing that the music I'm seeing in this modern age is because of that disgusting person. The reason I have certain ideas about myself and my community are because of that person. A true predator to all of humanity. Like not only did he take all of that from all those people that he like physically abused in proximity, but he's taken so much from all of the rest of us, especially the black community. I said this in my other video, he has sonically like landscaped this place. That man. Like really think about how deep that is. Welcome to another episode of Seen and Heard Podcast. I'm Sharon, your host, and Miss Kenneth, welcome. Greetings, greetings. <laughs> the downfall, finally, the downfall of Diddy, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. We're not gonna go into too much detail because there's so much that's still coming in, and a lot of the stuff that we're gonna talk about is is still allegedly, you know, uh, about his crimes. Mm-hmm. But I also want to insert, yes, he rightfully is being held without bond. Why is Trump allowed with 34 felonies to run it? Well, I mean, the, it's a rhetorical question. I, 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 I'm throwing the question out to the, to the listeners and the viewers. But it, that makes me angry. Yes, DDD deserves to be in, in jail. But Trump needs to be in jail, too. So I don't think it should be rhetorical. I think it should be a question that that, that there is conversation um, around and, and, and that there is conversation that uh, is per, you know, it, it's pervasive. It's out in the in the in cyberspace and that's probably. So you have president, uh, you have Trump, ex-president Trump <clears throat> with 34 felonies. There is a 40, at least a 48% chance that this man with all of his felonies could potentially be the president of these here United States. So I'm going to get real personal for a minute. There is a young lady in St. Mary's Parish in Louisiana. She's 11 years old. Her mom was pimping her out for money for drugs, her and her brother. Her brother's 15 and she's 11. And they got tired of it and, and they should get tired of it. So um, they came up with a plan. The plan ended up with them killing this man. The little girl was charged with first degree murder. She's 11 years old. So they, they, they bar, you know, they, 
negotiated it down to obstruction of justice. Well, first of all, she's 11. I guarantee you she can't even spell obstructionist, but that's what she is. She got a seven-year sentence. She's in juvenile detention for seven years. When she walks out, she will be 18 years old. So for those people, to include you because you're much younger than I am, so for those people in the generations beyond my generation, maybe the next generation, this young lady is going to come out jaded. This young lady is going to come out with no inspiration, aspiration, motivation, because there's no one in juvenile detention who's surrounding her with love, who's surrounding her with, you know, the sense of security. She's not had that because if her mama was pimping her out and she was only 11, who knows how long her mom's been pimping her out. And here she is, juvenile detention for seven years for, 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 for wanting to be free of a situation that society is guilty of uh, allowing to happen to her. How is it that she got seven years of juvenile detention and we have somebody who potentially will become president of these here United States and they have 34 fel felonious accounts? We are crazy. And I don't mean you because you probably aren't going to vote for him. I mean, we, the collective we, we are, we, we do not even deserve, we don't deserve to be able to talk about land, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We don't deserve to be able to talk about democracy. We don't deserve to be able to talk about democratic ideals. We don't deserve to talk about freedom because we do not know what any of those things mean when we sit on the sideline and, uh, and allow non people on, on, on non SCOTUS people to decide that all the stuff that he did. It, he 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 is he has immunity because he did it in the White House and it was for the you know sanctity of the country and the preservation of our liberties. That's BS, and we need to get rid of the 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 the, the lifers on the SCOTUS on su Supreme Court uh, bench. We need to get rid of them, but we also need to look at ourselves because again. I got to say it, she's 11 years old. So uh, seven years from now, when she comes out, what kind of person do you think she will be? And, and the justice system itself, Merrick Garland is a complete and utter failure. So, um, this tweet says, Diddy is still innocent until proven otherwise, yet he's in jail where he belongs. Trump is guilty of 34 felony counts one count of SA and has numerous other pending charges, yet he's free to terrorize this country, threatening uh, election officials, threaten judges, threaten the judges' families, threaten um, voters for exercising their, their constitutional right to vote. And New York Times, Maggie Haberman, and all of these other media outlets are still coddling him and trying to help talk about him like he is normal. There is nothing normal about him. Nothing normal about this. And him being able to and allowed to, to run for the highest office in this country. Like you said, that's this is an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. It is at a, at a minimum uh, an embarrassment. Because, again, <clears throat> nobody wants to talk about all the damage he did in the four years he was there. So just imagine what he will do to seal the deal, to, to you know, complete the circle. What, whatever you want to say it is the, the, the way you want to describe it. But. Just one example, look at all of the concert, quietly so, look at all of the white male conservative figures he has placed in the judicial system on the bench for life. Who, 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 who will they be sitting on high judging? They're going to be judging people who look just like you and me. 
And we, we are guilty until proven innocent, and we never really get to be proven innocent. And you got these biased judges. Where's the greatest amount of implicit bias? The greatest amount of implicit bias is in the legal system. It's in the judicial, uh, judicial system. So these hundred or so white male conservative judges, they can now, the, the, the message has been passed on to them. Hey, you're a judge for life. Go and use all of your implicit biasness. Do whatever you want to do because you are immune from persecution, prosecution, any of that. Um, and, and then getting him back in office just means anything he didn't do when he was there, he going to make sure he does it this time. Merrick Garland, right here, the mm -hmm. most feckless attorney general in the history of the United States, is basically rolling out the red carpet. You know, Mr. No One is Above the Law. That's a lie. This man, he, he keeps saying that when he get whenever they find him awake, he's no one is no one no one is above the law. Uh, he has not he has not charged or investigated any of those people that um, attacked our capital that are still in Congress, and then Trump roaming the country, wreaking havoc all over the place. So um um the 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 folk who tried to attack the Capitol on January sixth. You and I knew on January seventh nothing was gonna happen to those people. Now whether you wanted to admit it or if you just wanted to hope against hope, prayer against prayer, that they would be um handled to the highest of the Law. laws and, and where i'm going with this yeah. is that they're traitors and nobody wants to use that word they are traitors they acted like traitors their intentions were that they were going to become traitors and going back to my baby 11 years old she hasn't done anything seven years in juvenile detention and these people they 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 committed treason. They're traitors. They are they are nothing but traitors. I don't care what anybody says. And I hope somebody come knock on my door and ask me if I said it. Yes, I said it. <laughs> well, and and I mean that by definition, we're not saying anything wrong, and there's nothing allegedly about that because that's what they are. But it's just the fact that the the justice system is so broken. I mean, I'm I'm reading about this this young man he, here, Marcellus Williams. Okay, I'm gonna flip this around. So this is urgent. This is getting ready to happen in in three days. So the Innocence Project is working on uh, Marcellus Williams. He has three days away from being executed. Um, they need everybody's help to to try to reverse it, which I don't know if that's going to happen by the governor, governor Parsons in uh, Missouri, I believe. So he is innocent. It, come to find out that this man did not even commit the crime. They found through DNA, he did not commit the crime that he's accused of. And then the guy that actually committed the crime, it, it sounds like the central part five, the guy that actually committed the crime, admitted it and the, the the mayor is still is is disputing electrocuting this man where is this missouri missouri marcellus williams in missouri but isn't that where um michael brown was assassinated? i believe so yeah, Michael Brown. I think he was, I think Ferguson. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that, that that was close, but yeah. So in three days, and and he didn't even commit the crime. And this, they're, I, I just don't understand how somebody could sleep knowing that 
somebody's innocent. Like they were nowhere near. They're they're innocent. Yeah. Um, and you're still going to electrocute this person. So I don't know who the judge is now, but there was this young man who was in prison for life plus uh, in uh, um, Missouri. And uh, his name is Bobby Bostick. Um, 16 years old when they put him in adult prison. He was hanging out with some older boys and on Christmas Eve, they got the bright idea to go. They had seen some good Samaritans walking throughout the community, dropping off gifts, et cetera, et cetera. So they got the bright idea to go rob them of the gifts. He was along for the ride and got life plus because he would not, he, he didn't see that he had done anything wrong uh, and he would not plea bargain. The other, the older guys did a plea bargain and they got real light sentences okay. relative to life and never going to get out of um, prison. The judge, the judge was a black female who said he disrespected her in her courtroom and she had to teach him a lesson. So she issued the harshest punishment that she could issue life in prison without any possibility of uh, parole. So the only person who could uh, remove that sentence, say, time served, go, go be whatever you're going to be, be happy, see you later, is the governor. So let's look at this and say, and I think it's true, I think the governor was a, Republic, a, a Catholic Republican. I think that's the way it went. Fact check me. I apologize if that's wrong. Many, many letters were written to that governor saying, let him out. He He's finished his GED. You know, he has like a, a bazillion certificates. You know, you take this little program to get a certificate. Mm -hmm. He's maybe about a year off from getting his college degree. He's a model prisoner. Couldn't get that to happen. So when we talk about situations like this, we have to also look at, you know, the intention behind who we put in office. So this man, the governor of the great state of Missouri, he's not there for you. He's not there for me. He looks at our skin color and is like, oh, heck no. No, we're not going to do anything for them. So when, when we vote these people in or out, you know, to be honest, we have to become more strategic. We, we, we are not strategic. We just mm -hmm. go, we're Democrats. We just go and pull the lever and say, I voted for all Democrats. You don't know how to split your ballot. You don't know how to do a write-in. That's a problem. I'm going to leave and, it there. And, and on the matter of voting, with everybody listening, check, double check, and make sure you are on the ballot because they are pulling shenanigans all over the United States. They are purging rolls. So pretty much, I would say once a week, literally, once I would, I would suggest once a week up until to election, seeing what they're doing around the country, the Republicans, I would suggest once a week checking to make sure, especially if you haven't voted yet, make sure you're on the rolls because they're trying to purge people left and right. They're doing a, well, here's one. We want to talk about this. Postmaster General is a Trump boy. Mm -hmm. So, he also plays a major role here because he he can manipulate the, the services. He can manipulate who, you know, what zip codes get mail, which zip codes do not get mail. Uh, he can manipulate, you know, if the post, the, the carrier even comes to your community. 
So even though we're talking about mail-in ballots and, you know, getting your ballot, how do you know once you do your mail-in ballot and you drop it in the mail, what's your guarantee it's going to get where it needs to go? You have that kind of guarantee? Most people don't. So here we are talking about early voting, early voting, you know, cash your, cash your ballot, cash your, cash your, cash your whatever ballot um, so that you can get it over with. Well, it's just only begun because you don't, you, you don't know and there's no way to track this. You don't know whether or not your ballot is, your ballot is ever going to receive uh, be where it needs to be in order to be counted. Postmaster General is a Trump dude. Mm -hmm. um, and he will do whatever he needs to do to get as close to uh, bringing Donald Trump a victory as he needs to. And yes, and so Georgia has already done that where they passed a last minute ruling where they're doing the count by hand. Oh, that's even worse. You know, why? you know why? That's worse. Because here I am, I'm counting one, two, uh -huh. three. Uh -huh. And somebody says something to me. So do I say, well, I think, uh -huh. I think I was at, I just started. So I was at number one. Or I, I think I was at number 12. They're, either, they're way the numbers are skewed, either way, the numbers are going to be skewed. Right, right. So that's that. That's why they're they're pulling out every every trick in the book <laughs> for him. And unfortunately, we don't have a legitimate uh, Supreme Court, and we have no active DOJ or or, or Attorney General. So we'll just keep reminding people: check the voter rolls. Make sure you own on the roles because they're they're purging and then they're they're making changing these rules like in real time nobody's stopping them so we're we're gonna keep mentioning it and um thank goodness p diddy is in in prison but we need to get trump needs to be in in prison clive davis has a lot to answer for if you know, you know, people will talk about him in, an, in another podcast, Clive Davis. And uh, here is a, another picture. So this, this I'm going to close out with this uh, article here because it's been quiet as a church. <laughs> since before, before you, before you close been, out. Uh, and where's, <laughs> celebs are scared yeah. to speak out about Sean Diddy Combs. Everybody's quiet. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the jokes, the the jokes that everybody's taught, telling that I've seen, they're not funny. There's nothing funny about assault for a man or a woman. And from the details that I've seen of of this horrid uh, enterprise, that it, it, it's a, it was an enterprise, mm -hmm. and yeah. all these people need to be held accountable. Uh okay, fine. So I want to talk uh, one more thing about this whole voting thing. So we have 60 members okay, of the okay. Congressional Black We have 60 members of the Congressional Black Caucus. How many of them are actually speaking out about you know all of the nefarious issues behind voting? They are speaking out about, I you know, heard any of them. exactly, exactly. So again, if I were Euro American sitting on the other side, I would be like, well, you know, they don't care about what's going on with their people. So why should I care? That's the thing. It's like the, the, I, that's so frustrating. And yes, voting is a tool, but we need to get proactive. Like there's no time left. And I, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing, I'm not finding any communities, any, any groups that are 
being actually proactive. All I see is a lot of people say, well, just vote, just vote. You got to vote. Well, that's a given. But what are we going to do to stop this? Because like actively stop this because nobody that's in power is is trying to stop this on either side. And that's where where we were talking about the, the boycotts and stuff like that earlier. Mm-hmm. If if we had enough people to do a mass boycott, the only thing they care about is money. That's the only thing they care about. They do not care about the protests, the, the signs, or anything like that. We could do civil disobedience by not participating in capitalism. Just exactly. Get your necessities and don't spend money on extra stuff. So while I hear you, um, I, I may have mentioned this on another uh, session. Mm-hmm. Some years ago, I don't know, I can't remember what was going down, but some years ago there was a call for a, same thing you're talking, black boycott. And it was around the end of October, mid-November. Do you know how many black people said they couldn't do it? And the reason they couldn't do it had nothing to do with anything other than that it was a that was the wrong time to do a boycott because they had to go do holiday shopping. Now that's the perfect time to do it so that when you close out your books in January, mm-hmm. you ain't got nothing to show. According to a report by Nielsen, black consumers collectively have a buying power projected to reach 1.8 trillion by the end of 2024. By the end of 2024, 1.8 trillion. This economic influence extends beyond mere consumption. It shapes market trends, influences product development, and drives innovation. Okay, and again, and again, we are the we are the reason why there there are all these people coming up with inventions and ideas and you know what they can sell us, and it is up to us to say to whatever our name is, um, we ain't buying no more your 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 product. That, that's right. Enough is enough, and we we'll get. I, I want us to talk about this more, like uh, uh, behind behind the scenes we close out for our next one we're going to keep talking about this because eight one point eight trillion dollars i mean we yeah we need to we need to get something organized here but until then if if anyone would like to support me your uh we'll have donation links please like comment subscribe and share that helps the algorithm we uh we have merchandise uh, t-shirts, coffee mugs, pillows, and I'll have the donation links. I'm in the middle of a fundraiser. So please help us meet our goal. Our goal for this week will be, I don't know, $500. Help us meet our $500 goal. <laughs> leave us a comment, leave us a voicemail, have a question. Um, let us know uh, what you think of the show. And we will talk to you on the next show. Thank you, Miss Kittis. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's always my pleasure.